403. Welcome. It must be uh, somebody already. Uh, welcome to our Zoom session. You all know the rules. You all know what to do, what not to do. Don't forget that we are recording and uh, putting this up on YouTube forevermore. So <laughs> you don't uh, want your uh, ice lolly eating to uh, be perpetuated, then uh, turn off the camera. Uh, if you don't want your voice to, to be heard, leave yourself muted. Uh, and uh, all I have to say really in preparation is that our next meeting is um, the 11th of July, fortnight's time, where we have Vic Gammon, Sue Allen and Julia Bishop. Uh, that's our Routledge book special because that's three three of the contributors to a new book coming out from Routledge um, in a fortnight's time. So um, that's what those three will be celebrating. And we've been mentioning a new book by Dick, um, but not available in the UK yet. So we'll, um, for those who have only just signed on, we'll be talking about that at the next meeting on the 11th of July. So today we've got um, a really interesting spread of, of subjects. Um, we, as you know, we try to have all sorts of topics and all sorts of uh, perspectives. And certainly I think today we excelled in getting three very different topics to talk about. Katie is on first and then John Francis and then John Housen. So if we go to Katie Ryder first, and Katie was meant to be with us for the Folk Voice conference a few months ago, but wasn't well. Um, but as I said, once she's on the list, there is no escape. So here we are with Katie Ryder. And uh, I'll pass over to you, Katie. Okay, thanks very much. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I realise, first of all, that I'm probably completely unknown to all of you, so I'm very honoured and a little bit terrified to be here, so go easy on me, please. Um, just to very briefly introduce myself, um, I'm Katie Ryder. I'm a, a musician based in Sheffield. I'm a music teacher here, and I actually moved to Sheffield a few years ago for my master's degree, which was an, um, a master's in ethnomusicology which uh, sounds quite exotic on the face of it, but for me was based largely on folk music in England and particularly looking at gender. So this talk that I'm going to give today is uh, based on a paper that I did as part of my master's. So it's been nice to revisit the topic after a few years. And um, I'm going to examine the use of music and song in the campaign for women's suffrage. Um, and how this was actually interlinked with the folk song movement, which was taking place contemporaneously, um, as well as political and protest song more broadly. So I want to open today with uh, this photograph of an image of the WSPU or the suffragettes, as they became known, which might nowadays look quite familiar to us, really. Um, so the image shows some long, neat rows of women in, in military garb, headed by uh, four women playing drums, and there's another one with a big bass drum um, just behind them. Um, there's banners and streamers along the side as well. Um, and at the back, they are holding a, a big banner, which says, uh, Exhibition, Prince's Skating Rink, Knightsbridge. So even though this kind of image of the, the women looking very militant might be what we expect from the suffragettes nowadays at the time in a society where silence was thought to be the great duty of all women this would actually be highly shocking and especially in terms of music making um, for victorian women especially middle class or, or higher class women music making was largely confined to the domestic sphere if you think about the association between feminine musicianship and the piano, for example, by its very nature, it physically confined women to the drawing room. So this kind of image of very mobile women led by drum major um, Mary Lee, who's the slightly blurry figure who we see at the side here, um, 
this would have been extremely shocking. Also, they're where they're they've got woodwind instruments, percussion instruments, not at all what you expect from a feminine musicianship. Now, this was arguably simply a, a shock tactic of the sort the public would uh, expect from the WSPU. Um, but yes, uh, arguably a shock tactic. Um, and at this time, actually, there was an increase of militancy um, from the WSPU. Um, and it provided a highly visible and also audible propaganda tool. Um, and they may have been using this kind of thing to try and legitimize their militancy. So far from being an erratic, disorganized mob, these women were disciplined and determined in their battle for enfranchisement, with the marching band given the impression, impression that they were a real and serious military body. Now, we also see those that kind of imagery reflected here in these posters. So the one on the left is actually a poster for the same exhibition that the Fife and Drum Band in the previous image were advertising. And again, we see these images of militancy. Um, although you could argue that there are aspects of the Victorian ideal of femininity, the daintily pointed toes um, on the poster on the left, the respectable hairstyle, the, the clothing flatteringly bunched around the waist. Once again, we see brass instruments and even the way that the, the woman on the left, well, the figure in this, this picture, she has her cheeks all puffed out. It's, it's hardly showing feminine grace. And this image on the right here, the better known image, the bugler girl, which um, was originally a, a, a poster for the NUWSS or the suffragists as they were more commonly known. Um, even though the suffragists were generally known for not being militant, for using peaceful methods in their protests, we're still seeing this rhetoric of martyrdom, of militancy in their imagery. So um, as shocking as the ideal of a, a mobile military female musician might have been, um, with hindsight, as I said before, might not be that shocking to us now because the militant aspects of the suffrage campaign has become almost legendary. What might be slightly more shocking to us is to see images like this in relation to the suffrage campaign. So these um, are the, the Morris dancers of the Esperance um, Girls Club who I'll come along to uh, shortly. Um, and these Morris dancers at the aforementioned exhibition, which the Fife and Drum Band, band were advertising, um, alongside uh, exhibitions like replica prison cells at this exhibition, a female jujitsu teacher, it, it might seem surprising to us now that you would also be able to find exhibitions of Morris dancing. Um, and this actually doesn't represent the only crossing of paths, if you like, between the folk song revival and the suffrage campaign, um, which maybe given the fact that they were headed by similar kind of um, a similar demography of educated middle class, it might not be that shocking, but we don't have to go too far to find this crossover happening. And actually in relation to one of the most well-known figures of the revival. Um, so Evelyn Sharp was the sister of Cecil Sharp and she was an active campaigner for women's rights and a prominent member of the WSPU. She's actually a fascinating figure who I'd quite like to do a, a project on all on her own really, having uh, delved a bit into her um, in putting this together. So she worked as a journalist um, and she later became the assistant editor of the WSPU magazine Votes for Women. You can see her selling um, the, the papers in this image on the left here. And she was also arrested twice um, as part of the more the Votes for Women campaign. Um, the first time she was arrested, I think it was for breaking government windows. So it might seem quite surprising from what we know of the quite moderate figure of uh, Cecil Sharp. At the bottom here, we've also got a Christmas card, which was sent from Evelyn Sharp to Emmeline Pithick Lawrence. I can never say that name, Pithick Lawrence, um, who was the co-founder of the Esperance Club, 
with whom the Morris dancers in the previous image were associated. Um, it's been claimed that both the suffrage and the folk song movements were forms of social activism, um, whilst for the majority of folk song collectors, their main motivation seems to have been simply in terms of preservation and the publication of songs. There is one figure for whom the concept of folk music was very much tied into um, the improvement of society of a whole, of which women's enfranchisement was one part of that. And that figure is Mary Neal, who I'm sure uh, lots of you have heard of. Um, so Neal was born in 1860 and uh, in Birmingham and died in 1940. She was described by her close friend and prominent suffragette, uh, the aforementioned mentioned Emmeline Pethick Lawrence, um, as a, ch a challenging person who provoked others to violent reactions of like and dislike. I kind of hope that I get described that way one day, maybe. Um, she had a strong sense of humour and a profound aversion from unreality. And what's interesting is she's also often described as displaying masculine characteristics. She never married. And apparently she herself claimed that her heart is nothing more than a dried up piece of leather. Um, she was from a prosperous background. Um, her father was a button manufacturer. And yet it seems that she expressed feminist ideals from an early age. Um, as we can see from these quotations here from her unpublished manuscript, which is available um, online via the Mary Neal archive. So for instance, she says, from earliest childhood, I was haunted by the conviction that there was something more in life than the ordinary routine of a suburban lady's daily round of duties and pleasures. An early exposure to the philosopher and political economic, economic, economist, sorry, John Stuart Mills, um, his writing that apparently made her desperately discontented. Um, so her long held socialist ideals are apparent in her autobiography and um, this extended to her. She eventually met um, Emmeline Pethick, later Pethick Lawrence, um, whilst working for the West London Mission. This then led on to them founding the Esperance Club um, in order to gain more independence. They'd accepted quite definitely the gospel of socialism by this point. And um, this then led on to the Esperance Guild of Morris Dancers, the photograph of whom we saw earlier. Um, Neil states that she founded the club with one idea and one only. We would make our girls a bright and happy Christian home and we would share with them as literally as possible the good gifts which had been given to us in our own lives. So although Mary Neal is best known for her activities in terms of the revival of Morris dancing, she was first actually led to Morris dance through folk song and the wish to have dancers that would fit in the spirit of this folk song. Um, so the Esperance Club began singing English folk songs after the club's musical director read an article by Cecil Sharp. Um, and Neil writes that within a fortnight from the singing of the first folk song, I could only say the club had gone mad for the girls were perfectly intoxicated with the beauty of the music. And it seems that she viewed the singing of folk songs actually as a, a form of social activism in itself. She believed that singing the songs was very more important, that nothing did more for the girls. And um, in 1911, she wrote, I think this revival of folk music, which has taken place throughout the length and breadth of the land, is leading us to a oneness and a communion in which the life of the individual is tuned to the life of the nation. She also writes of a mighty force being expressed in folk song which she claimed was bringing women to, to women the call to responsible citizenship and to share in the widest and fullest life of humanity. In another article, which I've put on the slide here, um, which is entitled John Barleycorn, she actually uses imagery from the song John Barleycorn in claiming that women have been ploughed in by suffering and ruthlessly cut down again and again yet have risen triumphant and the harvest is near at hand. So the fact that this article actually appeared in the WSPU newspaper Votes for Women 
indicates Neil's commitment to women's enfranchisement went beyond simply holding these feminist and socialist ideals and the work she was doing with the girls club. Um, it was her involvement in the labor movement which led to becoming involved in the WSPU and she was actually part of the new committee of the London w WSPU in uh, 1906. And her Esperance Morris dancers regularly performed at suffrage events, such as the aforementioned exhibition. And in 1908, she actually expressed the wish to set up a branch of the WSPU in the Esperance Club itself. And there's certainly evidence that the Pankhursts, the most famous suffragettes at all, of all, may have visited the Esperance Club. So on the left here, we have um, a drawing from the sketchbook of Sylvia Pankhurst of dancing feet adorned with bells, which if you compare to the image slightly blurry on the right, you can see very similar, um, very likely that this was a picture of the Esperance girls drawn whilst at the club. Um, the, the club seems to be have been a general hub for the suffragettes, in fact, and others involved in the campaign for um, the votes for women. So it was Lawrence Hausman who later wrote the suffrage song, Women This and Women That, who actually encouraged Neil to start the Morris dancing movement on a national scale. And uh, Annie and Jesse Kenny, who were famous suffragettes, um, attended a holiday with the Esperance Club in 1908 along with Lady Constance Lytton, and she was convinced to join the movement actually on this holiday. And uh, at the bottom of this uh, document here, which is the Esperance book, where we've got signatures of the girls who were involved in the club, we have, in fact, Jessie Kenny's signature with Votes for Women written next to it. So in spite of all this, Neil's involvement in terms of music and the suffrage campaign is not particularly well known. Um, most of the discussions um, in terms of music in the suffrage campaign focused on this one figure, Ethel Smythe, um, who was actually, well, she died in the same year as Neil. She was born in 1858 and they were quite similar characters in some ways. And this, uh, this does go beyond the fact that I've chosen images of both of them where they, uh, they have a dog. Uh, that was just a happy coincidence. Um, but like Neil, she's described as having masculine traits and appearance. Um, she was described as being invariably dressed in battered tweeds and a pork pie hat. Um, she must have dressed up for this photograph. But um, both Neil and Smythe were also from prosperous backgrounds. Neither ever married, but they differed in fairly significant ways, which determined how they came to be involved in the suffrage campaign and their involvement in terms of music. So whereas it was Neil's links with the labor movement and her charitable work, which determined her involvement in the campaign, Smythe was a serious composer. She wrote full scale works, including operas, orchestral works, a mass chamber and instrumental works. And it was the difficulties that she encountered in the male dominated field of composition, which apparently led her to adopt feminist ideals. So, for instance, she wrote, the whole English attitude towards women in art is ludicrous and uncivilised. There is no sex in art. How you play the violin, paint or compose is what matters. So uh, she only joined the WSPU in 1910 and then gave an allotted two years when she was fully devoted to the campaign. She became good friends with Emmeline Pankhurst been suggested that they might have been lovers there's also reports that it was Smythe who taught Emmeline Pankhurst how to throw stones so compared to Neil who never seems to have got involved in the more militant aspects of the suffrage campaign um, that certainly wasn't a problem uh, Smythe didn't have a problem in taking more militant action and she'd actually de delayed joining the WSPU because of what she perceived as the sentimentality and the fluffiness of uh, middle class suffragettes. Um, and she scoffed at the, the sort of white robed, bewinged St. George like females who waved olive branches all over the posters. And one has to, uh, well, it does conjure an image of Neil's Morris dancers, perhaps, in that description. Um, 
Nevertheless, there are um, links um, with folk song um, in, in Smythe's music. So she wrote a suffrage opera in 1913 called The Boatswain's Mate, um, which uses folk songs such as Lord Rendell, The Keeper and Bushes and Briars, which she apparently collected herself in Ireland. However, it's this piece of music, which I've got upon the slide here, March of the Women, which is probably Smythe's most famous in relation to the movement. So it was composed in 2000, uh, 2010, 1910, with words written by Cicely Hamilton and was introduced as the official anthem of the WSPU by Emmeline Pankhurst. And it was dedicated to her as well. Um, so after being sent to Holloway uh, for smashing a window, there's a very famous account of Smythe uh, conducting this march with a toothbrush from an upstairs window and joining in herself while the ladies below marched and sang. Um, Smythe actually described this as typically English. Uh, well, she described aspects of it as typically English, which is interesting because it was adapted from a traditional Italian melody. Um, nevertheless, um, it was described in Votes for Women, the WSP newspaper, as at once a hymn and a call to battle. Um, and once again, we see this rhetoric of crusade and militancy and martyrdom. Um, and in some ways, it became a bit of an art song, as well as being used for marches. It was sung by choirs of ladies at, uh, at suffrage teas and things like that. Um, this was all in spite of the fact that apparently the song was almost impossible to sing um, with a leap to a high E flat, which apparently is very unnatural sounding. Um, and it's been suggested it was never successfully sung by the majority of the suffragettes who marched through the streets shouting it a lot of the time. So I don't think we'll have time to listen to this now, but I do invite you to go away and, and have a listen and see how a uh, singable you think it is in your own time. Um, so although in this sense the march might seem very removed from the world of traditional song which Neil was so keen to revive, um, there are links, well that there is the suggestion that she wanted to make the march accessible to lower class suffragettes as well. For instance it's arranged in sol fa so there's the intention that it can be sung by the musically illiterate as well as those who would be able to read music. Um, and it, it has been called a propaganda song. Um, so no less cheap, portable and pocketable, a multi-purpose commodity for, for the mass market. And in this sense, similarities can be drawn to England's earlier political song so um, England has a, as I'm sure lots of you know, a very long history of expressing political sentiment through song. Um, the main um, medium for this having been broadsides. Um, so I'm not going to read these two quotes for you now, but basically broadsides, um, they reflect supposedly the, the men of the people, they were composed by men of the people for the people. Um, and they are the rude but most expressive monuments of political struggles. So these two quotations, which I've got here, um, are actually interesting in, in the sense of this talk, in that they both use the word men. Now, this might just be following the convention of using mankind to mean people, but it nevertheless raises the question of the extent to which women before the suffragettes had been involved in the creation and transmission of political ballads. Um, we know from first hand accounts that women certainly played a part in the transmission of songs and they were amongst the main purchasers of broadsides, but it's not so straightforward to know to what extent they were actually involved in writing them. They'd certainly been the subjects of broadside songs, for instance, this one here. Um, the, where in, in this one, the drunken husband, we see the influence of industrialization. Um, 
in in this particular sense uh the wife responds to the dr the husband's drunkenness by selling his possessions attacking him with various kitchen utensils before finally breaking his nose um and yes although you know this undoubtedly depict, depicts a representation of women in stark contrast to the victorian ideal it's likely that this song was written by a man in response to the female broadside market. However, we do know of some women who wrote um, political songs throughout the 19th and into the 20th century. And there was a particularly strong tradition of songwriting amongst mining communities, particularly in the northeast of England. Um, one of those being Jay Knight, who wrote this song, The Pitman's Grievances which contains the lines, our masters are hard hearted, our wages they'll not rise, they will not hear us speak a word, our wants for to appease. It is unlikely that Knight received any payment for her song, which was published in order to raise funds for the Durham miners strike of 1844. And in this sense, perhaps it's not so dissimilar to the March of the Women by Ethel Smythe. Although we don't have a tune for Knight's song, as opposed to Smythe's song, there's a fundraising aspect and the mode of transmission via song sheets is quite similar. Also the language. So according to uh, Bert Lloyd, out of the coal fields, a genre emerged that used um, a form similar to Methodist hymns to express a militant message cast in a modern poetic idiom. And this same description could arguably be applied to March of the Women just as much as this song, The Pitman's Grievances. Um, so if we accept that there's a link between the earlier protest songs, such as those written by Knight and March of the Women, it might seem surprising that the March of the Women was hailed as being the, the first time that the suffrage movement was, um, was uh, typified in music as it was put by votes for women at the time and actually this is ignoring a large body of suffrage songs which occurred before Smythe's song and these songs again can be linked back to earlier protest song um, and can be viewed as a continuation of that tradition so for example, here we have some uh, decidedly militant verses by Theodora Mills. These were composed by between 1905 and 1906. And again, we have them being um, published in a, in a pamphlet distributed to raise funds, um, just like the trade unions were doing um, in the earlier years of the 19th century. Um, we also have links in terms of the tunes that were being used. For instance, Mills' Rise Up Women uses the tune of John's Brown Bo John Brown's Body, which was the same tune used by female chainmakers for a rant during their uh, for a chant for their strike of 1909. And actually, many of the early suffrage songs set new words to what might be called folk melodies. For instance, the tune of the Keel Row Hornpipe was used um, to set the lyrics for As I Came Through Holloway. Um, that was an anon anonymous song. Again, maybe links with the broadside tradition in that a lot of these songs, um, these suffrage songs were actually published anonymously. Um, there's another song on this sheet uh, which uses the tune of Men of Harlech, which is a traditional Welsh tune which appeared on broadsides. And um, we've also got the song John Peel, um, which has been uh, uh, supposedly traced back to 1695 version of Red House published by Playford in 1695. So to conclude, um, to attempt to conclude, really, because um, if there's one thing that I found whilst putting this talk together, it's that I completely lost any sense of what folk music or the folk voice as you might call it actually actually is so whilst it's tempting to say that by using a similar medium um and similar melodies for their songs songwriter suffragettes like theodora mills were actively grounding their music of the tradition of working class protest song it seems more likely that they were using these melodies because they were inspired by the folk song revival, 
which was being consumed by the middle class, really. And actually these songs were kind of being absorbed more as drawing room ballads. Um, they were used alongside hymns, alongside um, tunes like um, the tune of Samuel Taylor Coleridge's Hiawatha. Um, it, it was a whole canon really of middle class drawing room songs. However, I'd like to use this to, to just raise the question, does, does this make it any less valid as a, as a folk voice and indeed as a, as, a, as a sound of protest, if you like, um, the fact that these songs may have had the hallmark of the middle class. Um, and what do we even mean by the folk voice at, at the time um, when these revivalists were collecting their song, their songs, they probably wouldn't have considered um, Jane Knight's um, trade union songs, for example, whereas now that kind of song would generally be accepted as a folk voice. So I'd just like to put the, put the question out there of, could maybe these suffrage songs also represent maybe a watered down, maybe a, a different and yet still a folk voice? And with that, I think I've very much run out of time, so I will stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Katie. That was excellent. And yes, you did run out of time. I was just about to interrupt and say, you're running out of time, but that was very good. Thank you. Excellent start to the day. Now, we, if we're going to do, we're going to do questions, but we've got very little time for questions. Um, Sorry about so, that. But yeah, no, that's fine. It was, it was fascinating. I didn't want you to stop, but I was thinking about the rest of the time. Um, if you want to put your hand up, please do, but I'll only take one or two questions. Uh, in the meantime, Katie, is your MA um, available, your, your thesis? Um, it's it's not actually. So that, that wasn't part of my thesis. My thesis actually looked at the um, gender in folk sessions. Um, it, it was an ethnography of folk sessions happening now, but I am looking at the possibility of publishing or in some way making available online both my thesis and that that particular piece of work looking at um, suffrage and music. Yeah, I think, I think well, I, certainly I would like to read more and, and look at the pictures again. Uh, <laughs> they were great. Uh, and you've, you've raised a lot of really good questions there. And uh, various people, if we had more time, there's various people here who would who would comment, but I don't, but nobody is asking questions. So we're going to move on, if that's all right with everybody. Thanks again, Katie. Thank that was you. Excellent. Um, we're going to go to um, somebody we haven't heard from before, John Francis. Uh, I hope you're still there. I can't see you, John. I'm uh, still gonna, there. Yeah, yeah, great. Still I'm going to talk about Paul Williams and his um, arrangements. So over to you, John. Thank you. Well, while I'm just sharing a screen, can I just say, um, that I very much enjoyed Katie's talk, and that um, it was nice to hear something of Evelyn Sharp, because um, most of you probably do realise that Evelyn Sharp wrote the libretto for Vaughan Williams's comic opera, The Poisoned Kiss. It's not a folk opera, so I don't suppose it would be an attractive subject for a talk to uh, this forum, but um, if you ever want to learn a bit more about The Poison and Kiss, it's the most wonderful opera. It's full of love and passion and, um, and some humour that survives from Evelyn Sharp. And I'd be happy to talk, talk, talk to you about it at any time. Meanwhile, what I'm talking to you about now is We the Singing English. It's the story of our folk song arrangements series. Sound. 
Albion Records was formed in 2007 as a subsidiary of the Rayform Williams Society, which is a registered charity, and has so far issued about 40 CDs, also available for download and streaming, of course, most of them including world premiere recordings of works by Vaughan Williams. We keep a list of unrecorded works and are just beginning to approach the bottom of the barrel. It was in January 2020 that my fellow trustee William Van and I started to get serious about folk songs. Will is director of music at the chapel of, of, of the Royal Hospital Chelsea, where the pensioners live, and also a brilliant pianist specialising in the accompaniment of songs. We've made a number of recordings together already. By January, um, uh, sorry, by January 2020, we'd mustered a list of 59 folk song settings and started to buy scores online. By early February, we got to 68 and then 80. We finished up with 81. We thought we'd fit all 81 of them on three discs. We had a Christmas carols recording booked for late March 2020. And if the lockdown had started just a few days later, that would have happened. So we lost that recording, which we've only just finished. In those early days, although choirs were banned, we felt that it would be all right to work with a much smaller socially distanced group. So the folk songs project was accelerated by about a year. The Henry Wood Hall, just off London's Borough High Street, was discounting rather heavily in the absence of its usual customers, which are generally bigger choirs and orchestras. So we got them to throw in the piano for nothing and found ourselves in a superb acoustic in London. The next problem was Lord Thomas and Fair, Fair Eleanor, with a brown girl and a fair girl. I'm sure, sure many of you know it. We were a bit anxious about the sensibilities. We decided that this was all about hair colour. I know about similar references in Samuel Pepys's diary, and we felt that this was okay, providing that I addressed the point in the CD booklet. Sensibilities a hundred years ago were, sometimes, were somewhat different, and any hint of premarital sex was rigorously screened out of these songs when published. I don't think traditional song enthusiasts would altogether recognise Lovely Joan as it was published in 1935. Then we found ourselves a bit short of scores. Some of them are fairly rare, and with all the libraries closed by the pandemic, we were in danger of being absolutely stuffed. Folk songs for schools had the cuckoo and the nightingale and servant man and husband man, and that proved particularly elusive. Happily, I tracked down a bookseller called Chuck Whiting in Fullshear, Texas, who was selling a copy. Chuck very decently scanned the six pages that we needed and emailed them to me. Our singers were old friends, baritone Roderick Williams, OBE, soprano Ma uh, Mary Bevan, MBE, and tenor Nicky Spence. Nick is Scottish and so obviously not part of the empire. These singers are all at the top of their game for this kind of work. We also had a chorus of six very distinguished singers who are often singing with Stile Antico, and in fact the King Singers. We made the recording over five days in June. One song that held us up for a bit was the Farmyard song, which we put at the end of volume two. It's just hilarious, impossible to sing it without laughing. Nicky was going to do it all by himself, but this was clearly impossible. Mary offered to sing half the animal noises, and finally, all of the animal noises, and just eventually they got it together. The real hero of the piece was the producer, Andrew Walton, who stitched the track together from goodness knows how many takes. The producer is a very important person who hears everything and misses nothing. He made them repeat the take again and again until they got it right. Let's hear a bit of it. I had a little turkey and the turkey pleased me. I fed my turkey all under the tree. The turkey went, the cat went, the pig went, the dog went, the goose went, the duck went, the hen went, the cock went, coppery crow. Join in every neighbour's cock and my cock, well done too. And it's join in every neighbour's cock and my cock, well done too. That was in folk songs for schools, by the way, with no hint of double entendre. When we finally had first edits for the audio, which, which, which took a while to come through, we found that our timing estimates had been a bit off. 
so we trimmed volume one back a bit and decided that we better lay it all out on four discs. Perhaps 80 minutes of folk song arrangements is too much for one CD anyway. Let's focus on quality rather than leaving people wanting less. Later on, we realised that we have now erred in the other direction and volumes two to four were lighter, especially volume three. So Will joined me on another recording session in Cambridge and we slipped in Vaughan Williams's piano arrangement of a dozen country dances from Maud Carpenys. Maud was very difficult about these dances and Vaughan Williams wrote to her at the end of it, my spirit is quite broken. We ended up with four CDs, 81 songs, 57 of them no less first recordings, if we allow for just four that are on a forgotten LP. So, these, so, so those four are just the first digital recordings. All these had to be documented. And where was they going to start? Well, to start with, I had a lot of help from Nick Wall at the English Folk, da Folk Dance and Song Society, and he led me towards Martin Graver. Martin is a member of the, of the Rayform Williams Society and has been a great help to me all the way through. Of course, I've spent hour after hour searching the library at vwml.org, and I received welcome help from Tiffany Hoare of the EFDSS, um, from Elizabeth James of King's Lynn, Alan Helsden of the East Anglian Traditional Music Trust, and Lindsay Babin of Trues Yard Fisher Folk, Folk Museum. I think some of you at least are listening today. Thank you all. If you are persistent, you can learn something about every song. It can be difficult to distinguish fact from legend, especially in King's Lynn and perhaps in Ingrave. My notes for volume one with full text were so lengthy that the booklet ran to 40 pages. I had to find a new CD manufacturer who was able to print at least the internal pages of the booklet on 90 gram paper, as opposed to the normal 130 grams, in order that the, the uh, booklet would fit into a CD jewel case. Finally, we needed CD covers, bearing in mind that two of the more substantial groups of songs were arrangements of songs, Kessel, arrangements of songs collected by Cecil Sharp and Maud Carpenys in, in America and Newfoundland, I went international and licensed, licensed paintings by the American folk, art, folk artist Paula McHugh, who sings as well as paints. I love the pictures and I think they've made our series of recordings rather distinctive. Folk Songs Volume 1 sold more copies in its year of launch than any other CD that I've launched. There is an audience for this music. In 1936, Vaughan Williams wrote to EFDSS in defence of folk song copyrights. These are copyrights, by the way, for collectors, not for the singers. If once the folk song is made free, we shall find a host of unscrupulous impresarios, publishers, jazzers, in fact, anyone who sees money in it, working their wicked will on distorted and mutilated versions of these tunes. This has actually happened in the dreadful maltreatment of searching for lambs, which appeared in a recent play. It is the business of the EFDSS to see that the folk song is brought to the people, but not its bastard offspring. These are strong words from a rather Victorian gentleman, but they indicate his respect for folk songs in the form in which they were found. This is what he said in the 1950s. At one time, everybody sang our traditional songs. Every Shakespearean character from Iago to Stefano could quote a ballad at request. And you will remember the Squire Western in Tom Jones, who probably could not read or write, preferred his daughter to play Bobbing Joan on her harpsichord rather than the latest novelty by Mr. Handel. I seem to have said nothing about the tunes. Well, what is there to say about them? Except that they are beautiful and immortal. They belong to us all, high and low, rich and poor, without money and without price. They belong to us who, in the immortal words of Hubert Parry, sing what we like and like what we sing.
we were singing English. A huge question for members of the traditional song forum is whether you approve of piano accompaniments. And I'm pretty certain that some of you don't. I think we have to go back to the late 19th and early 20th century when people like Sabin Baring Gould, Martin Shaw, Vaughan Williams, Lucy Broadwood and others were producing folk song arrangements with piano accompaniments. Who, they asked themselves, was going to sing all the folk songs that they were collecting? All the evidence was that they were dying out in their natural environment and they were tapping the memories of elderly rural or fishing folk. When they were gone, so would the songs be. It was quite certain that the songs would not survive on the farm, on the fishing boat, in the factory. They resolved to get them out to the public. Cecil Sharp, as you must all know very well, was on a great educational crusade and was keen to get them into schools. Vaughan Williams certainly supported this. Some of the songs in our series are taken from a series of publications called Folk Songs for Schools, and that crusade bore fruit, at least for a few decades. In the first half of the 20th century, many people, perhaps as many as a million every year, took part in competitive music festivals and folk song arrangements formed part of the staple fair, both for solo and choral singing. Paul the Pirate was just uh, sung by group after group after group at these festivals. So that was another means of getting them out there. So the songs have not been the exclusive province of the EFDSS or of folk club clubs. Many of them have permeated into a broader section of the populace. Let's just have a quick break from me to hear, to, to, to hear Roddy Williams singing the Brewer. Without any balm, he makes the most pitiful beer. A brewer without any balm, he makes the most pitiful beer. And just in another such case is a shoemaker wanting of leather. Sing fa la la little Aldi. A shoemaker wanting of leather, he makes the most pitiful shoe. A shoemaker wanting of leather, he makes the most pitiful shoe. And just in another such case is a tailor without any cloth. Sing fa -da -la little Aldi. A tailor without any cloth, he makes the most pitiful suit. A tailor without any cloth, he makes a most pitiful suit. And just in another such case is a baker without any flour. Sing fal de la little Aldi. A baker without any flour, he makes the most pitiful bread. A baker without any flour, he makes the most pitiful bread. And just in another such case is a singer without any beer. Sing fal de la little Aldi. A singer without any beer, he sings a most pitiful tune. A singer without any beer, he sings a most pitiful tune. And just in another such case is a brewer without any barn. Sing fa -da -da little Aldi. I should add that Vaughan Williams only collected a few verses for that uh, song and uh, on a previous recording we just had the couple of verses that we had sung twice. This time Roddy and Will wrote a few more and I'm sure you'll feel that the last one about the singer without any beer was deeply felt. Many of the Vaughan Williams settings are really rather daunting for amateur singers requiring a fairly accomplished pianist. Was he really hoping to put these settings on the same standing as songs that he'd written for inclusion in concerts, art songs as they're sometimes called? If he was hoping for exposure in the London concert halls, I think he was largely disappointed. Campbell McInnes, a good friend of Lucy Broadwood, was an exception who took folk song arrangements to the London stage. But I think they largely found a, ho found a home in people's homes, schools and choral societies. Since then, the arrangements, like the original folk songs, have repeated history. They've lost their context. They've fallen out of favor. 
Albion's aims in reviving them are summed up by what Vaughan Williams said in Gloucester in April 1903. If you thought that the tunes which have been sung to you during this course of lectures were beautiful, then I should at all events have it to my credit that, that, that I have introduced to you some imperishable specimens of beautiful music. If on the other hand you do not think so, then I hope that my saying they were beautiful would not make any difference to you. In the latter case, we should simply have to agree to differ. On that note, I'd like to conclude with a clip from the unquiet grave. When this Well, there we are. That, that's the end of the talk I've prepared, and I think I've kept to the time reasonably. If you haven't got any questions for me, I'll play you an encore, but I'm ready to hear some questions. Thank you very much, John. You've kept perfect time. That's um, setting a good example to the other people. <laughs> um, do, do you want to unshare your screen for a moment so I can see? I'll do that. I can't see the hands going up. Well yes. done. That was, that was very interesting took me into places that I knew nothing about. My first, I've got a question. Um, you referred to Vaughan Williams and his list of uh, uh, jazzers and unscrupulous people and bastard offspring. I'm not sure where I fit into all of that, but I think bastard offspring would probably suit me. Um, where Where is that quote? Because I'd like to use that. I, I, I will send it to you. It can be found on the, on the VW vwml.org website it's a letter to um to roy kennedy is it right martin is it roy kennedy is it douglas kennedy it's douglas kennedy thank you no. not no. Michael kennedy. yes that's great thank you because as i say i really want to i want, <laughs> I want to learn that by heart it was excellent it's a, uh, it's frankie, letter it's quite a tirade yeah it's it's, it sums up an awful lot of things. Kate, um, Frankie, you've got your hand up. Oh, well, as, as the person who started off the Folk Voice uh, conference some while back, I, I mean, I don't object to pianos at all, but I do find myself shrinking somewhat. It's the trained pronunciation. I love Roderick Williams' voice. I've been to see him in concert, live in concert, uh, and I have enormous respect for him. But I do remember going to a concert of Andrea Scholl, the amazing, well, I love him, uh, countertenor, singing folk songs. He did a program of folk songs 
and Dowland, and he said quite clearly, if you're going to sing folk songs, you've got to listen to source singers. You, in order to know how the phrasing works, it's much closer to conversation. And you, know, I, and I just feel I want to say to all your singers, uh, John, listen to source singers in order to witness more authentically. It doesn't mean you've got to be a different kind of singer. Andrea Scholl wasn't attempting to sing with a different voice. But, um, and I, I think I'm probably not the only person listening to this that's voicing this particular prejudice against trained singers. Well, I think so. Over, yeah. over think pronouncing. So. Yeah, if I'd, if I'd had a longer talk, I would probably have contrasted Roddy singing the captain's, the captain's apprentice with a source singer, uh, giving a, a really full-blooded rendition of the captain's apprentice, because it's quite an amazing contrast, isn't it? And I'm sure you all know the sort of source I'm talking about. Um, yes, there is a, there is a divide there, and I can't bridge that. I would like at some point to make a recording that takes some of Vaughan Williams's folk song research back to its roots and make a and try to make a folk recording around folk singers and Vaughan 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 Williams. I haven't quite worked out how to do that, but I but you know the ideas are buzzing. Thank you. Uh, can we move on to Conrad? You've got your hand up. There we go. Um, source singing is very, very good to, to, to think about. It's very important. It's another way to get the music out to the people or out to an audience. I find that the audience often forms the shape of the presentation. Also by demographics, by retirees, older people, you have to envision all the possibilities of the lifespan. People, once they get older, tend to be more conservative, don't want to have some, some sort of fast melody, something that's relaxing. So that it, it goes, goes right into the parlor. And then again, there is the song hall, music hall, also another outlet. What we need to look at, it seems to me, is how each of those packagings changes the song's intent and feel and organization, internal structure. Because as you get something that comes out of music hall, pass it into source music, it changes from source music to parlor, it gets more formal. And you have also the varieties of, of state, and all those varieties of venue mold the presentation, which in turn should have an effect that's demonstrable on the uh, relationship between the song and the public in the future. Seems to be a Vaughn Williams material. You can only, hard, it's hard to get some of the root material. That's all we have there. So there's a great influence of his uh, reforming or reshaping of the tune. Thank you very much. Thank very you, nice. Thank you, thank you Conrad. I don't agree that she reformed or reshaped the tunes. I think, so far as possible, within a time signature and within a, um, and within a key signature, he respected the tunes to um, the greatest possibility within the context of a classical music framework. I think he added accompaniments to them, but I don't think he reformed the tunes. Well, it's more of a, as you said, an accompaniment, a classical music setting. I, I, I shouldn't have said tunes. Yeah, I think the accompaniments follow the words and the drama, and I didn't really have a chance to explain this because again, it was quite a brief talk, but I could certainly give you an hour on the accompaniments because I took them apart when writing the notes. And it's amazing the way they pick up the drama. And sometimes the accompaniments are absolutely silent. There is no accompaniment. Sometimes they just touch and sometimes they trot along, but, but, but he's picking up the drama in the song and the intent of the song and in some cases the working context there's one that just trots along and that's and that's emphatically there in the accompaniment it, and it's great fun so i, I, like think, there's, the I think there's scope for traditional folk singers i think the scope for all the varied things that Vaughan williams did did with folk 
he, um, folk songs, he made arrangements of them, he used them in orchestral works, he used them in operas, he, he wrote a cantata around folk song. The scope for Steel I Span, I love, the, uh, I love them very much, I'm a great fan of Maddie Pryor. Um, so I think there's scope for a lot of variety. Folk song, I think, is something that has to go on reinventing itself because it didn't die around 1900 and it isn't dying now. But it, it, it cannot only go back to the past. It has to have a way forward. Thank you. Thank you, John. I think we're going to have to stop the commentary on this one now because we're running out of time. But another round of applause for John Francis and, and them singers and piano players. Uh, and I think that's something we could return to at a later date, um, unpacking some of the things that you've talked about as to how um, Vaughan Williams went about uh, a company, you know, writing accompaniments and so on. But we must move on because the Sharabang is waiting outside the pub. Um, so if you'd all like to take your seats, John Housen is going to take us on a, on a trip. I don't know who the designated driver is, but uh, it's not me. Uh, so, John Housen, over to you. Hello. Uh, I'll share the screen first of all. No, click on the purple. We have that. Okay, we've got the wrong slide up, but there you go. Right, here we go. All aboard the Sharabang. Um, I just want need to adjust my picture because it's going to be over what I'm showing and I won't be able to see it. Uh, where is it? There. Right, that's fine. OK, so we're going on a musical journey. We're actually going to go on a pub crawl, uh, a pub crawl around the pubs where we're going to hear musicians and singers, the singers and musicians who played in each of the nine pubs that we're going to visit. Um, now, there's quite a lot of you. So as you can see, I've actually booked two Sharabangs um, to take us on our journey. Now, first of all, as ever, we need to do the geography lesson. So um, there's a map of Suffolk on the left, or map of England, I should say, showing Suffolk in East Anglia. And then on the right hand side, we've got two areas of Suffolk, Mid Suffolk and East Suffolk. Um, I'd like to start just by reading you something that I wrote some time ago. In any discussion about English folk music, the county of Suffolk will be soon mentioned as an area where numerous field recordings of traditional singers and musicians have been made. What seems strange is that most of these recordings were made in the coastal region of East Suffolk, particularly in two pubs, the Blacksell Ship and the Eels Foot in Eastbridge. Maybe this is because the early collectors found this such a fruitful area and they saw no reason to venture further west. When we moved to near Stowmarket in the late 1970s, I felt there must have been a similar musical tradition in Mid Suffolk as there was in, on the East Coast. Of course, I was right. And apart from a few recordings by Des Herring in the late 1950s and the early 1960s, as far as folk music research was concerned, it was actually virgin territory. So there's the map of where we're going to go. So we're starting in Stowmarket and we're going to finish in Stowmarket. We're going to do a circular route around another a number of very pretty villages, actually. Um, what we're going to do is actually start um, at the railway station. We're going to, all going to meet at the railway station. Then our first perambulation will be on foot. We're going to walk from the station down to the Greyhound pub. Greyhound pub was in the centre of town. It's closed nowadays. Uh, it was a popular gathering place on market days as, an in, as there was an entrance at the back of the pub straight from the livestock market. And there is the railway station. Now, on each bit of our journey, we're going to have a musical accompaniment. Uh, and it will be accompaniment from a musician who played in the pub that we're actually heading for. So uh, we're starting off with Charlie Griggs playing for us on our way to the Greyhound. He was a regular in the Greyhound. Uh, and off we go. Walking it for
the ground and there's the back door and the, as you can see there's just been some pigs delivered uh, so we're going to go into the pub and what i'm going to do when we get to each pub is introduce you to one singer who was a regular in that particular pub and our first singer is manny aldous he was born in the village of often but lived in great bryceit um, his daughter daughter-in-law actually heard of my song collecting and contacted me um, to meet him he had a large repertoire of songs learned from other local singers, often actually on market days in Stowe Market. Unfortunately, I only met Manny three times before he died, and I recorded him singing the song Cleverly Done, Said He, in 1987. The good old man, he went out one day, Artful, artful, dinner all day. The good old man, he went out one day, He left his old woman at home to stay. Oh, what a bad woman was she! Oh, what a bad woman was she! The clerk of the parish passed by that way, Artful, artful dinner all day. The clerk of the parish passed by that way, She called him in by the wink of her eye. Oh, what a bad woman was she! Oh, what a bad woman was she! Unfortunately, I obviously can't play the whole of each song, um, otherwise we'll be here until midnight. Uh, but I'm, I'll explain this song in case you don't know it. So uh, you've heard the first bit and then the man comes home. She pretends to be ill and asks him to get an apple from the tree. He climbs a ladder. She lets the clerk out. She pulls the ladder away and he falls to the ground. What a charming little song. Anyway, I think... <laughs> I hear the shadow bangs. So we're off on our first trip in our buses. Uh, we're going from the Stowe Market Ground to the One House Shefton Dog, and we will be accompanied by mouth organ player Tom Williams, who lived in Stowe, Upland, uh, and he was a regular in the Shefton Dog. Here we are at the Shepton Dog, a wonderful uh, thatch pub, as you can see. And inside, we're going to meet Hubert Smith. Uh, Hubert was a regular at the Shepton Dog, particularly on a Saturday night. He was a stockman, uh, and he actually practiced his songs to his cows. Uh, he also played melodeon, had a dancing doll, which he actually bought in the Shepton Dog from a local character called Ben Southgate. I made this recording of Hubert singing Ball of Yarn in 1983. Oh, was one fine summer's day in the merry month of May. I was scrolling down me dear old father's farm. When I met the pretty miss and I shyly asked her this, May I wind up your little ball of yarn? So I took his pretty maid to a spot beneath the shade, intending not to do her any harm. And to my surprise, when I gazed into her eyes, I was winding up a little ball of yarn. Lovely stuff. And what can I hear? <laughs> yeah, Chalabangs are here, we're all ready to go. So we're now moving on from the Shepton Dog to a village called Felsham. The pub there is the Six Bells, and we're gonna be accompanied by Cyril Barber, who actually lives just around the corner from the Six Bells. Thank you. 
and there's the Felsham Bells, which is still open. Um, and inside, we're going to meet Emily Sparks. Now, Emily was born actually in a village we've just gone through. If you notice, a village called Rattleston. And it's funny in Rattleston because everybody is called Sparks. I remember when I was doing research and I went into the post office and asked if anybody knew Mr. Sparks. And they said, uh, mm, which one? Um, now, many local singers actually visited Felsham Bells because they had a singing room upstairs. Uh, and most of Emily's songs came from her father, who also played the concertina and step dance. Uh, Des Herring recorded Emily Sparks singing The Iron Door in 1959. Her hair was black as the raven's feather. Her form and features describe who can. And yet her fully belong to nature For she fell in love with a servant man Her father built a dungeon of bricks and mortar With a flight of steps for it was underground And the food he gave her was bread and water the only fair that for her was found When her father found him so tender-hearted Down he fell on the dungeon floor He said true lovers should never be parted Since love could enter an iron door Lovely singing and if we can get him to work no we've moved on right so we're now actually going into the countryside uh, we're leaving felsham six bells and we're going to thought maru bull you'll notice in suffolk you always put the village name before the pub so it's not the bull at thought maru it's thought maru bull uh, a pub now unfortunately is closed but uh, it was a cracking pub when it was open our musical accompaniment on this branch of the trip is Glyn Griffiths, who was a Welshman who lived in Cockfield, uh, but he was a regular in the bull on a Saturday night. There it is, that's Thought Maru Bull. And inside we find Tom Smith. Tom Smith was a Thought Maru man, uh, born and bred there. He worked on the land, um, and most of Tom's large repertoire of songs came from his father, Bert Smith, uh, who sang in the Bull a generation earlier, along with other local singers, including Tom's brother George, Herbert Game, Briar Crick, and Truby Reynolds. I made this recording of Tom singing John Barleycorn in 1985. If I can find it. There was three men came from the west and they were all a dry. They made a vow and a solemn vow John Barleycorn should die. They made a vow and a solemn vow John Barleycorn should die. They ploughed him in the ground so deep, put clods all over his head. They made a vow and a solemn vow, John Barleycorn was dead. They made a vow and a solemn vow, John Barleycorn was dead. Put brandy in a glass, my boys, put cider in a can. Put barley broth in an old brown pot, he'll become the brightest man. Put barley broth in an old brown pot, he'll become the brightest man. 
lovely singing again uh, and a complete version really 10 verses unfortunately i can't play them all for you um and there's the charabang ready for us for our next uh part of the journey and can i just say i hope everybody has been to the toilet in this pub because we're now going on the longest stretch of the journey and we can't afford to stop and we're off to thought maru sorry we're off from thought maru bull to Tosta Gardner's Arms. Um, now, the, our musical accompaniment is quite different this time. It's actually a dance band, a dance band that was run by Jimmy Gladwell in the 1950s in the area. Uh, and their accordion player actually was a tossed up man, Andy Austin. And here we go, we hope. So the Gardner's Arms. Very pretty village of Tostock um, and our singer here is Charlie Carver now this was a real singing pub um, but we've got very little knowledge of uh, Charlie Carver uh, we just can't find much about him yet um, we do know he worked on the land and he was definitely a regular amongst the many singers in the Gardener's Arms including Sid Allen, Shocker Clark, Gypsy Charlie and the Everett family uh, in the photo we've got there, that's um, Charlie there with the Trilby hat on at the back. Uh, wait a minute, I'll point to him. No, I won't. Yes, I will. There he is. And that is another singer, that's Sid Allen. Uh, Des Herring recorded Charlie singing Cupid the Ploughboy in 1960, actually in the pub in the Tostock Gardener's Arms. Oh, as I walked out one May morning, the May was all in bloom. But just to take the fresh air and smell the sweet perfume, there I saw Cupid the Plowboy cutting his fur as deep and low. A cut in the clods to pieces, some barley port to sow. I wish that pretty young ploughboy my noise had never seen. For it's Cupid, the pretty young ploughboy that looks so sharp and keen. The lady she consented to be the ploughboy's bride. They went unto the church together, and there the knot got tied. And now they live in a plenty, well, they both got gold in store. The lady and the ploughboy, they join forevermore. Now the audiences were as noisy then as they often are now. Right, all outside, onto the Sharabangs, and we're now moving from Tosta Gardens Arms. We're going north up towards uh, Walshamley Willows, where the pub is the Blue Boar. Uh, our accompaniment is Walsham mouth organ player, Bill Smith, who was a regular in, actually there's, there are two pubs in Walsham, and they used to play in both of them. And inside we found Lubbardy Rice. Um, strange old name, his name actually was Oliver, Oliver Lubbardy Rice. He was born in Gislingham and lived for many years in Finningham. Um, 
He was a local character. He was a keen poacher and a champion runner. Uh, he sang and also played melodeon and mouth organ in many of the local pubs, particularly those in Walsham. Uh, I made this recording of him singing 21 years in Dartmoor in 1983, when he moved to sheltered housing actually in the village that we live in, Hawley. 21 years, boys, they put me to jail. Don't serve down in Dartmoor because I had no bail. The judge said to the jury, I know it is fine. For twenty-one years, boys, is a mighty long time. The judge said, stand up, boy, and dry up your tears. You're sentenced to that more for twenty-one years. So hold up your head, boy, and say you'll be mine. All the best friends, my part, babe, so must you and I. Oh, governor, good governor, you'll make up for all. Your place got a smell in, just like a no stall. Oh, governor, good governor, you're still in your chair. While I lay breathing, this filthy old air. Lovely old singing from him. Uh, that last verse seems to me to be quite unusual. It doesn't seem to turn up very often. Anyway, out we go, back on the buses. And we're now heading from Walsham to a village called Wickham Skeeth, where the pub was the Swan. Uh, our musical accompaniment is a mouth organ player who also played the bones. Uh, and he's a Wickham, Wickham man. In fact, he cut his musical teeth in the Swan. And if I can get me mouse to work, we'll go. And there's the Swan in Wickham Skeeth, a uh, pub that's not, as well, it's been closed for years now. Uh, but you see there seems to be a bit of a flood because the kids are all uh, wading around in the water. Now, Wickham Skeeth, I found probably one of the best singers I came across. That's really, really good, interesting songs. Um, his name is Charlie Stringer. He worked on the land and was an expert horseman. His father, Wag String Stringer, was the local blacksmith, uh, and he actually took Charlie into the Swan when he was just five, and it was from him Charlie learned a lot of a lot of his songs, and uh, I recorded Charlie singing Kibosh the Cobbler in 1984. Yes. Now my name it is Kibosh the Cobbler. I've been at it now all my life. Just to earn an honest copper, so to take home to the wife with my twine, 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 twiddle twine, with my twine, twine, twither all day, with my wax for the riddle, I lady, with my wax for the riddle all day. Now my wife, she's spending my money As fast as I'm bringing it in From morning to night she keeps boozing Way down at this old pub in So with my twine, 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 twiddle twine With my twine, twine, twither all day with my wax for the riddle, I laddie. With my wax for the riddle all day. Oh, the wonderful Charlie Stringer. <laughs> and on we go to the penultimate pub. Uh, we're actually now going from Wickham Ski Swan to Mendelssohn Green, Green Man. Uh, and our musical accompaniment is from a very fine melodeon player who lived in Mendelssohn called Reg Pyatt. <laughs> Thank you. 
there's the green man um uh, of all the pubs uh we've been around today uh that's probably the one pub i'd love to go back to uh, it's been closed for many years um but it certainly had quite a tradition singing tradition uh, and our singer from there is gordon sorrett now gordon told me the Sorrits moved to Mendelsham in 1665 and has been a Sorrit living in Mendelsham ever since. When I go, I'll be the last. Uh, he recalled many heady nights of singing, playing and step dancing uh, in, the, uh, in the Green Man uh, with old Kruger, Bung Stanner, Ted Thorpe, Pom Hart and a local gypsy family called the Loveridges. Uh, I made this recording of Gordon singing M-O-N-E-Y in 1982, when he was 95. It's money that makes a mare to go. It's a saying old but true, that when you've got the ready cash, your friends, they'll stick like glue. But when your purse is empty, those friends you thought sincere will proudly turn upon their heels and quickly disappear. M-O-N-E-Y, that is the stuff to bring you joy when you've got the LSD. Everybody seems so free, folks you've never seen before flock around you by the score girls to win your love will try for your m-o-n-e-y that's a fairly rare song i think um there's only a few references to it in steve's uh, song index uh but it was actually the favorite song of albert uh, sorry arthur hewitt who was the landlord of blacksell ship when peter kennedy recorded there and final time onto the bus buses we go and we're on our way back to stow market uh we're going to a pub called the pickerel which is almost opposite the station where we started out um our musical accompaniment is actually from fred whiting um and he used to use the pub on a particular time of the year and i'll tell you about that in a minute and he's going to Company is on the fiddle with dancing dolls. And this is the Pickerel, a uh, pub that's still there. Um, I don't think you'll hear a lot of musical singing there nowadays. Um, but we're actually sticking with Fred because uh, Fred's an in interesting character. He's actually from Kenton near Debenham. Um, he, his first job was working with a flock of sheep uh, and he learned songs all of his life, including some when he worked in Australia. Uh, but he'd visit the Pickerel during the cult fairs so young horses when they're selling young horses uh, and that was a time when local singers would gather in the bar and no doubt he picked up songs there as well i made this recording of fred singing an unusual version of the barley mow in 1986. well we plowed the land and we planted it and we watched the barley grow we rolled it and we handled it and we cleaned it with the hoe. Then we waited till the farmer said, it's time for harvest now. Get out your scythe and sharpen, boys, it's time for barley mow. Well, it's luck to barley mow and the land that makes it grow. We'll drink to old John Barleycorn, it's luck to barley mow. So fill up all the glasses, lads, and stand them in a row. 
a jill a half a pint a pint a pint and a quarter need luck to barley mow have no fear of young john barleycorn when he's as green as grass but old john barleycorn is strong enough to set you on your ass but there's nothing better ever brewed than we are drinking now Fill them up, we'll have another round, is luck to barley mow. Yes, is luck to barley mow, and the land that makes it grow. We'll drink to old John Barleycorn, is luck to barley mow. So fill up all of the glasses, lads, and stand them in a row. A jill, a half a pint, a pint, a pint, and a quarter, is luck to barley mow. Well, I'll drink to that. Um, this has been a small selection of the singers and musicians I've discovered in Mid Suffolk. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed them. And all I've got to do now is uh, pay for the charabangs and let's hope you all have a safe journey. Excellent, John. Thank you. That was wonderful. Completely different, and that's the way we like it. Everyone's got to be different. Um, I think Paul Williams would have had some problems with the journey because it's difficult to get the piano onto the back of the charabanne, but I'm sure they could have managed it if they tried. Uh, we do, we've, and you kept to time. Everybody's been very well behaved this week. Do we have any questions or comments, or are you all gobsmacked by the wonderful singing? I mean, that was really good selection of songs there John. Um, Derek, hello Derek, you've got a question. Hello Steve. Uh, hello Derek. Hello John. Of course doing a, um, a Sharabang tour around the pubs, um, it's very male dominated, so could you just make some comment on female singers that you recorded, perhaps not in the pub, um, what sort of balance was there and just say something about the different context of the women singers and musicians? Well, I, I've got to admit, I recorded very few women singers. Um, and I think mainly because I was probably doing research in pubs and a lot of the women singers really only sang at home. Um, and certainly, you know, if we go back to the East Suffolk, to Blacksell Ship, the women used to sit in another room. Um, and, you know, all I did was I could just ask everybody I knew when I was doing research uh, about anybody they knew had songs, and it was invariably, I'm afraid, it was men. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else got a question or a comment? Yes, Conrad again. Hello, Conrad. Muting. Yeah. Well, we just lost a pub, just look, looking just like the Green Man. In uh, Route One, this is one of those speakeasy pubs uh, on their highways, and uh, quite a loss. They had had very very nice music, but pub tours around here we used to do quite a few of them in the 70s and 80s, and every one shaped the music just like a, a, a mold. We, we took women to pubs. It's not women singers, but we'd take the women with us. They hadn't been in these neighborhoods ever and never, never would ever go there otherwise. And one time we had a big full house and we talked the women in and they went back to the back table and all the ex Marines and got up and just promptly left. And the table was there and they were able to stay and enjoy things. But uh, the loss of pub tours is an amazing loss for all of us and they should be subsidized. But anyway, that's my point of view. I think on the, one of the problems now with the pubs around here is that they invariably have become restaurants. Um, I mean, the wet trade has almost disappeared. So the pubs that are still open are just really they're dominated by food. That's where they get the money and also by, by harvesting money rather than providing service. Absolutely. How much money can you get for that beer? That's what we can we do for you, help you with your argument with your neighbor or whatever used to do that, but not anymore. Uh, Katie, you'd like to say something. Oh, hello, Katie. <laughs> hello. 
Um, I'd just like to add a little PS to to Derek. Oh, yeah, to Derek's uh, uh, question in that. Um, uh, just thinking of the people that we actually knew in person, Dolly Curtis, who was a, a melodeon player um, in a pub uh, regularly, and we played with her. John must have forgotten that bit. <laughs> yeah, but she wasn't in Mid-Suffolk. N- no, she was Well, anyway. Um, but her family kept the pub, and that's why she had a kind of special dispensation, if you like, at a time when women didn't really go in the pubs very much, that, that she was part of it, and other women were in the same pub as well. So um, although it wasn't... Uh, common, it wasn't exactly unknown if you had that kind of connection with the pub, is my feeling. Yeah. Thank you. Right, well, I... We had one pub tour where we were confident of seeing a couple of people with flannel shirts playing Appalachian music. I interviewed them and talked to them during the daytime, but we came back at night and it was filled with very short people, all Central Americans, smoking those heavy cigars. And uh, total, totally, totally in, 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 entirely different. Pubs change during each hour of the day, or should, to meet the clientele who are available. She thank never you, Tony. I think it's time we, we've um, got to wind up now. Thank you again to our three speakers. A really strong and interesting afternoon. As always, they'll be up on YouTube very soon if you want to revisit them. And as far as we know, they'll be there forever. So we'll see you in a fortnight's time, everybody. I hope you've all enjoyed yourselves. And uh, that's all from our, from us for now. Goodbye. Stay well. <laughs>